<laughs> Good morning, everyone. We have a long program today, so we're going to get started on time. There are still some chairs down front here for those who are coming in the room right now. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Lee Hamilton, president of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Steve McDonald. I head the Africa program here. The Wilson Center, as you know, is the uh, living memorial to President, uh, former President uh, Woodrow Wilson. And we are honored to be able to host this, uh, uh, this uh, conference today uh, in partnership with the uh, Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. Um, this is a very important uh, conference that we're having this, this morning. On the heels of the 2003 Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, the United Nations High-Level Task Force on Food Security, and the commitment by donors in 2009 at the Lakia G8 Summit to commit more than 20 million billion to support a renewed global effort on food security. The uh, State Department issued a statement in uh, September 2009 pledging interagency cooperation to work to reduce hunger, promote food security in collaboration with other donors, the private sector, partner countries, and citizens of the affected countries. The goals enunciated in that statement were to sustainably reduce chronic hunger, raise the incomes of the rural poor, and reduce the number of children suffering from undernutrition. The statement said this would be done by working with the global community to advance the comprehensive strategies that enable developing countries and to work with all stakeholders to set targets and a time frame for action to achieve these goals. It then identified several strategic choices to be made in conjunction with a wide range of government agencies, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, civil society, and the poor themselves. These choices were listed as follows, a targeted focus on agricultural development as a primary means of driving economic growth and reducing poverty in partner countries, embracing a community and country-led approach where partner countries decide on their own needs, solutions, and development strategies, building local capacity across central governments and communities and farm organizations coordinating donor and other stakeholder investments, stakeholder investments through a multiple stakeholder process that invests in country-led plans, focusing on improving the productivity and market access of small-scale producers, particularly women who make up the majority of small farmers in developing countries, catalyzing private sector economic growth, finance, and trade with necessary investments in public goods as well as policy, legal, and regulatory form, reforms the use of science and technology to sustainably increase agricultural productivity, protecting the natural resources base upon which agriculture depends, investing in improving nutrition for women and young children as a foundation for future growth, and finally, committing to a whole of U.S. government approach that improves efficiency and increases the coordination and accountability of our investments. The Afri Pro Africa program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, in cooperation with the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa, has hosted a number of, of events in the year since that statement was made to look at the various aspects of global efforts at food, of food security in Africa. Today, we're going to assess where those efforts stand, the progress and the challenges. We have a number of experts from U.S. government agencies, the United Nations World Food Program, and, uh, and private sector NGOs involved in this comprehensive approach who will speak today on these issues. Um, I would like to thank the partnership, and particularly Julie Howard, who is here with us, uh, who, which has again worked with us to bring this conference together. Uh, the morning will unfold with three specific technical panels one on implementing local, regional purchase and purchase for progress programs, a second one on improving the nutritional quality of food aid and targeting, and the third implementing a comprehensive approach and old and new tools to improve country capacity to manage food security. Uh, at the end of each of these panels, we will invite you uh, to, to join the speakers in a dialogue and question and answer period to look at some of these issues. But before we turn to our technical panels, um, I would like to invite two speakers to the podium uh, to give us uh, some introductory remarks and set the scene for what we are going to discuss later in the morning. Uh, they will be in the following order. Peter McPherson, who is president of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. McPherson is the former chair of the Board of Directors of, da uh, of, the Board of, Directors of Dow Jones and Company and the founding co-chair of the partnership. Uh, he is the chair of the Board of IFDC and chair of, of the Board of Harvest Plus. 
He has recently completed the chairmanship of a commission created by Congress to consider ways to greatly increase the number of students who study abroad. Uh, prior to joining uh, the APLU, uh, Peter was president of Michigan State University for more than 11 years. He knows my former colleague very well, uh, Howard Wolpe, who of course is from Michigan as well. Uh, Peter will be followed by Her Excellency uh, the um, uh, Ambassador from Mozambique, Amelia Matos Sumbana. Um, ambassador Sumbana has been uh, the ambassador here since November 4, 2009. She previously served as a member of the National Parliament from 94 to 2009, as well as Secretary of the Central Committee for International Relations of Free Limo Party from 97 to 2006. In addition, she was a founding member of the Mozambique Red Cross and has served as its deputy uh, president uh, from 2000-2004. Ambassador Matos has also held posts at the Ministry of Education and Culture as well as the UNDP. The ambassador completed her higher education at Eduardo Le Mondelan University in Maputo. Uh, we are going to welcome both of those in order uh, and uh, then we will turn to our first technical panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you for your, I guess, about 40 years of work in Africa. <laughs> uh, we appreciate all the, all the effort that you've had over these decades, and we also appreciate, we, the partnership, uh, the wonderful collaboration we had here with the Wilson Center. Uh, we work so well together, and what a great forum this is for, for these events. I, Julie Howard, the the executive director and CEO of the partnership is right here in front. You, Julie, you ought to raise your hand. She does so much of the key effort in this, and I, and I think we need to appreciate, we all do appreciate, Julie, what, what you do. Washington is a place where it's very easy, perhaps more so in today than in past years, to fall into big battles where everybody in, is, at least in some part, only debating what the facts are. Mm. Uh, yes, there's policy discussions, but we, we clash and we don't really come to understand each other very well quite often on a number of issues. This has probably always been true, but I've thought in recent years it, it was uh, especially uh, a pattern. Well, a few years ago, the partnership and so many of you here uh, got together and thought about this set of issues in connection with Food for Peace uh, and broadly defined. And it was clear on issues like local purchase and monetization and so forth. We were, yes, we were de debating some of the policy, but in many ways we're debating the facts. And as a result, we felt that we, the partnership, felt that we could be a forum to begin to work through some of these questions. And so with many of you here, in March of 06, uh, we had a big meeting. I can remember it well, over there at 1307 New York Avenue, where uh, government, the private sector, NGOs, and I look around the room, many of you, uh, we got together and we, big, we had this big discussion. It was a very civil discussion uh, and with quite conflicting views. Remember we had Lanto say, Lanto said, remember that was a, he's such a grand old man, I didn't think he was right about his point there, but he was, he's a, he was a wonderful man. And it worked really nice. But the conclusion out of that was that we would put together a statement of the facts with some recommendations, but it was, in many ways, a, the major effort was what are the facts? Because it's clear that there wasn't a broad understanding or acceptance of what the facts are. Uh, that was a big project. Amy Simmons, uh, Mary Chambliss, sitting right here, raise your hands, folks. You'll be seen later, I'm sure. Uh, and Julie, that was a big project. Because, of course, we circulated the paper, this was, and everybody, you know, got it. But we came out with a document, which not everybody agreed to, but a document that n narrowed the questions quite a lot. Uh, and out of that, we then, we then had a further 
set of discussions. Uh, and, and those discussions focusing around the regional purchase issue, the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust, monetization, and so forth. Well, the papers, the discussions, in my belief, this may be a debatable fact, but in my belief, had a real contribution to, to the 2008 uh, Farm Bill. Uh, not everybody got what they wanted. There's some things I think everyone here would probably say need to be further refined, but it was clearly a step forward. Uh, you'll see on the table out there a summary of, that, of the Farm Bill as pertinent here. And it was, a lot was done. Well, that was 2008. Uh, and has been followed, uh, following that bill, a lot of work has been going into this. The implementation of these changes isn't cut and dry like everything else in this area. Uh, there are hard issues and hard facts to deal with. Uh, and we understand, I think, all of us, that this is not a uh, right or wrong set of problems. So it seems particularly appropriate, given this history, going back now four years, that we would be here today, two years after the Farm Bill, uh, to look at where we are. What are the issues uh, in, in what we have? So I'm especially pleased that, that you, many of you who have been part of this from the beginning, are here today to, to work at this once more. Ambassador? We're so pleased to, to welcome you again to this country. It's been a few months, but, uh, but thank you for being here, and thank you. what a great country you represent. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, Steve, thank you for your words. Uh, Mr. Peter McPherson, I'm very glad that uh, I'm here, and uh, I'm among great friends of Africa, and particularly friends of Mozambique. I'm very honored to be here. So allow me to thank Partnership to Katanga and Poverty in Africa and Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars for convening this important conference and for inviting me and my country to be part of this distinguished panel. I would like to commend Partnership to Katanga and Poverty in Africa for excellent work in advocating the African cause, both in U.S. Congress and administration, and also in organizing and carrying out research work aimed at improving agriculture and livelihoods of many Africans. U.S. food assistance programs play an disputed role in our continent, and in particular, my own country, Mozambique. It has been crucial in saving lives at times of humanitarian crisis, resulting from natural and man-made disasters. In Mozambique, for instance, the place I know better, food aid was critical during the armed conflict, helping to feed displaced populations in refugee camps and victims of the prolonged drought in the 1980s and 90s. Commercial food aid was fundamental in maintaining reasonable level of food supply through the commercial network after the signing of the Rome Peace Agreement in 1992. The peace agreement was signed after the strife between Mozambicans. It was a civil war. Food aid was used for the reconstruction of schools, hospitals, roads and bridges, through the Food for Work and Food Monetization programs. Food for Work is a program which helped the Mozambicans to regain their self-esteem in terms of saying that uh, they had to work to earn something, not just to wait for someone to give. Today, Mozambique is less dependent from food aid. We have been successful in relaunching agricultural food production through multi-year investment programs in the agricultural sector, such as the PROAGRI, Food Production Action Plan 2008-2011, to 
the Agricultural Marketing Strategy 2009-2014, focusing on increasing production through applied research, improving infrastructures. Infrastructures are very important in Mozambique. We lack infrastructures, and we have been having many, many and uh, support from the U.S. government and from other donors in many ways. So I want to stress the improving of infrastructures and adoption of advanced production methods, including commercial farming. The attainment of sustainable food security in Mozambique is therefore a medium-term goal. In this endeavor, we count on the support of our development partners, such as the U.S. government and several non-governmental partners. The non-governmental partners, they have been very important in Mozambique, in different fields, in food security, in production, and the commerce, helping people to, to, to be themselves. U.S. food assistance programs in, to Mozambique go beyond food aid. They include support to local production capacity and regional market integration through trade facilitation initiatives. We are pleased to see Mozambique among the pilot countries named in the Feed the Future High Level Initiative. We look forward to participate in programs under this initiative that supports Mozambique's vision for agricultural development and food security. It's really a great honor for Mozambique to be part of this pilot program. I think that uh, is this kind of programs we need for the development of Africa. Local and regional purchase of food supports local and regional food production. We commend the World Food Program, a long, 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 from long ago partner of Mozambique, to continue purchasing agricultural products locally and regionally, hence creating market opportunity for African farmers. Initiatives like this, besides stimulating agricultural production in Africa, contribute to fostering regional integration. Mozambique is part of the SADC region, Southern African Development Community, which uh, <clears throat> is aimed to the integration of the region. And uh, we believe that uh, only or mainly with the integrated programs in the region, uh, the development will come faster. I also salute the U.S. government for organizing a special session on agriculture and food security during the next AGOA forum. I believe the event will constitute an occasion for African leaders to engage their U.S. counterparts on this important matter. In summary, U.S. food assistance is a necessity for Africa and for my, for my own country, Mozambique. Food assistance programs must be demand-driven and adapted to concrete needs of the beneficiary country. They must provide humanitarian response at times of crisis, but build production capacity through research, infrastructure improvement, and integrating markets locally and regionally. The success of such programs should be measured by the time needed to replace these programs by the local sustainable production capacity of food in the African continent. We want to be part. Africa is a developing continent, but uh, with many resources, many people, hardworking people, and we want to be part of all this world's development. Well, let me thank you for hearing my words and I look forward to working with you in this uh, great opportunity to be part of this uh, conference. I thank you all.
Thank you very much, Ambassador and uh, Dr. McPherson. Uh, we will now take a short break. Before we do, let me give a little plug. The Ambassador mentioned uh, the coming NAGOA Forum. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center here will be uh, conducting the Civil Society Forum in conjunction with the bilaterals on uh, July the 28th and 29th in the same auditorium, where we'll be discussing several issues, but including agriculture to, uh, development and, uh, and food security. Uh, so you're all welcome to come back for that. Um, I'll now invite uh, Emmy uh, Simmons to gather her panel and uh, come to the fore, and we will begin our hard work. Thank you very much. All right, we have a panel of four and a half, or four plus one. Um, Steve, the, the the Oops, sorry. Your sign's already down here. It is. Put John at the end. Sorry. John at the very end. Yes. Jamie. Okay. Alan. Go. Great. And then me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me just start off um, just giving a little introduction to this panel, and then I will sit down, and we're, I'm going to try to pre tend to be Gwen Ifill or one of these very dynamic uh, moderators and kind of engage our panel in a conversation about local and regional purchase. As Peter McPherson was just mentioning, you know, in, when the Farm Bill was under discussion in 2007-2008, um, a lot of the issues of food aid were being hotly debated around town. And one of those was, in fact, what the appropriate role for the United States might be in the local or regional procurement of food aid. Local procurement meaning purchasing food in the country in which it is going to be distributed, or regional procurement meaning within some of the neighboring regions, neighboring countries of the region, and then being distributed in a country. I would remind you all that there's another definition of local procurement which is related to cash transfers and the use of vouchers. In, in the cash case, families that are in need are provided cash directly with the understanding that there are adequate supplies of food in the market and that access is preventing them from, from getting this food. So provide, by providing cash, they can undertake the local procurement themselves. Vouchers are similar, except they're usually linked to designated market outlets. The World Food Program has, in pragmatic terms, been the leader in local and regional purchase for a decade. So while we in the U.S. are still talking about local and regional purchase as kind of a new tool for the U.S. food assistance program, WFP has already made it a major part of their practice. Uh, in 2009, World Food Program spent just under a billion dollars on the, on the procurement of food, 70 to 80 percent of which was in developing countries. So the whole practice of local and regional food procurement is, is expanded, is of significant scale, and is important, particularly in Africa. WFP also began a couple of years ago, and we'll hear more about this, implementing a program called Purchase for Progress with the idea that by targeting or by organizing procurement in a specific way, it could better help to link smallholder farmers to that potentially productive food aid, food assistance market. And we'll hear more about that from Alan Jury, our WFP representative. But somewhat surprisingly, I think to some people, the United States has actually entered into the use or started to use the tool of local and regional procurement of food aid uh, in a much more expanded way than we could have predicted when the Farm Bill was passed in 2008. The Farm Bill simply authorized USDA to undertake a $60 million four-year pilot program to test the local and regional procurement approach. But in 2008, in separate appropriation action, a budget supplemental was passed, which enabled USAID to procure food aid in local and regional markets. And in 2009 and 2010, additional money has been provided to USAID to undertake local and regional procurement. So 
while USDA is, is implementing the pilot, and we have Jamie Fisher on our panel to talk about that, um, USAID has also moved forward with local and regional purchase using funds passed through the um, IDA account. So I'm sure you all out there, as we at the partnership, have been saying, okay, how's this going? Since there's so much action, a lot of it focused on Africa, we really felt it was time to examine the record of local and regional purchase and find out how it's going. What are the big lessons that we're learning? What kind of commodities are being purchased? What are the, com are the commodities actually moving more quickly from purchase point to food aid consumer as we expected? What kinds of market impacts is all this local and regional procurement having? How are these impacts being monitored? Are they, in fact, pushing prices up, making some people having, have a harder time getting food? Or are they, in fact, simply expanding the market overall? Is there any collective action between USDA and USAID with regard to planning and implementing monitoring action? Or perhaps are USAID and WFP working more closely together on monitoring market impacts as well as impacts on the recipient end? Are there any cases where procurement, once it was kind of set up, actually was stopped when it was noticed that it was having market distorting effects? These are some of the questions, I think, that have really come to our, our minds, and this panel has agreed to include and try to address them in answers. So we have four experts on the panel with us today. Alan Jury is the director of WFP's U.S. Relations Office here in the, in the United States. John Brooks, end of the table, is the team leader for USAID's Office of Food for Peace's Emergency Food Security Program. Dale Skorik, who's sitting in the back of the row, has agreed that if John can't answer any questions, he'll take it up. Uh, Jamie Fisher from USDA is the, with the Food Assistance Division of the Office of Capacity Building and Development, and she has been particularly engaged in the design and implementation of the pilot program authorized in the 2008 Farm Bill. And Phil Thomas, here on my left, is the Assistant Director for International Affairs and Trade at GIO and one of the lead members of the team that has focused on food aid over the years and produced a May 2009 report on local and regional procurement. A very, very short tear sheet on that report is out on the table outside, just in case you didn't notice it. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to sit down there, and I'm going to try to divide our we've already gotten a little bit behind here, divide our conversation into kind of four segments. One, asking our panelists here to really address the big picture. Secondly, to, look, to talk about some of the advantages, some of the benefits that have been realized by implementing local and regional purchase programs. Thirdly, to sort of surface some of the challenges that have come out as the programs have been implemented. And then lastly, addressing this question of monitoring and evaluation of, food aid, of the um, local and regional procurement programs. So with that kind of structure, let me sit down and throw the qu first question to Alan, to Alan Jury. Um, WFP has been a leader, as I mentioned, in the use of, of local and regional procurement over the years. It's used both sort of headquarters procurement, procurement uh, using sort of standard trade techniques, about, um, tenders, um, but it's also used cash and voucher programs in different regions. So share with us a little bit, um, Alan, what the experience of WFP has been so far. Um, okay, I guess it's already on, yeah. Well, as Amy already, I mean, Amy already said, for WFP, local regional procurement is not a new tool, but an integral part of our work. In 2009, we purchased, we purchased 2.6 million metric tons of food, which is more than 50% of the total food we distributed that year. And of that amount, 80% came from developing countries, valued at about $770 million. This was the largest uh, region was Asia, um, with the largest single country where we did local purchase was Pakistan. Um, India was the second largest in Asia, and Africa was the second largest region at $228 million worth of purchase with South Africa and Uganda being the biggest single countries. Now, 
WP local and regional purchases have been steadily growing since 2002, but they peaked in 2008. They were down a little bit in 2009. Uh, down only a little bit in volume, more down in price because 2008, as you know, produced a tremendous spike in, in prices. And so the dollar value of our, of our purchases went down about 30 percent, even though our volume was a negligible decrease. Uh, from the 2008 levels. Now, the goal of our local and regional procurement has been the, the bulk of it. I will get to some of the new tools in a second. But the traditional local regional procurement, the goal has been saving money and saving time. We can get the food there faster, and in some markets, can have significant cost savings depending on how close the food is, how, how viable the market is. So it's been cost and speed of delivery in our emergency programs that has been the driving factor in our traditional, the biggest bulk of our local and regional purchase. What we've seen in the last two years is an evolution toward other elements in our toolbox, the expansion of the toolbox, the food assistance toolbox used by WFP. And in the context of this discussion, I'll just mention two, which is Purchase for Progress, which Amy has already talked about, which is our program to make a targeted effort to, to buy from uh, smallholder farmers, and the other is the use of cash and vouchers. Now, P for P, as we call it, is a five-year program. 2008 to 2013 in 21 countries, 10, 15 of which are in Africa. It has broad donor support. Uh, the, the basis was Melinda and Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but the Howard Buffett Foundation and several governments, including the U.S., have also contributed to it. The goal, the difference of its goal versus the overall local procurement is it has an explicit target to purchase from smallholders and to have an income benefit to smallholders in addition to the cost and efficiency arguments of general uh, local purchase. I've been asked to tell people to turn off their Blackberries and iPhones. <laughs> it's, uh, we're getting some feedback. We're getting some feedback, so I think we're... I'll go back to have, have to get out the technical announcement. I'm truly a technical panel if I'm announcing that we're supposed to be turning off the blackberries. Um, the goal over five years is to purchase from 500,000 smallholder farmers over five years. We're only in the second year of the program, so we're at an early stage. To date, we have purchased 50,000 tons through P for P in 17 of the 21 countries where we're present. So we still have four that are sort of at the preliminary phase of analysis and baselines and so forth. But there are 17 that we've already done purchases, and I suspect by the end of the year we'll have done purchases in all 21. We've had 100 farmer organizations that have sold food to WFP. We trained about 25,000 people uh, from local farmers, organizations, and a variety of techniques. As Emmy noted, the U.S. has become an important player in, in this in the last two years. WP has received about $180 million in I don't know who's doing this, but <laughs> it's a gremlin. Okay. 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 Uh, $180 million. $180 million, <laughs> most of which is from, the, is from the USAID program. A small amount is from the USDA pilot, including this year, and that'll bring me to my concluding remark, uh, for the first time, cash programs not directly related to local, local and regional purchase. We just received a grant from USAID and, uh, with regard to Haiti and cash for work in Haiti. And we have submissions in and, and expect that there will be likely other cash and voucher programs. We are doing cash and vouchers in, in several countries. In the interest of time, I, I really am not going to go as much in cash and vouchers as P for P, but certainly can answer those questions as they come up in discussions. Great, great. Thanks, Alan. Let's turn to John then and have a little bit of information on how sort of USAID has been doing uh, local and regional purchase and how your approaches looked the last year or two. Sure, great. 
I'm glad you mentioned the fact that Dale is actually sitting in the audience this morning. It'll kind of help when we get to the one of those phone or friend moments on any of the questions that would otherwise come my way. The Emergency Food Security Program under Food for Peace is a, is a new initiative for us, quite frankly. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, USAID's Office of Food for Peace hasn't been involved in um, determining how um, our limited resources were spent with respect to local and regional procurement. But as a program initiative, um, the effort now being managed by the Office of Food for Peace actually expands beyond simply local and regional procurement in the traditional sense that we were a part of over the past couple of fiscal years and actually now has a built-in component that allows us to use the resources for cash transfers and also food vouchers. So that's a, a relatively significant point to make. Um, the fact that we um, have added these additional two uh, components to the program itself, quite frankly, means that we have an opportunity now to work with cooperating sponsors who have expertise in those particular areas. Um, the local and regional procurement, as, as, as in the traditional sense, is I think up until this point certainly benefited um, those organizations who have had a, a history of running these programs in the field. They've had the infrastructure, they've had the staff and the, and the expertise. And so now it's actually a very good thing for us that because we have the cash and, and the food vouchers component that we're able to engage with other organizations, particularly the PBOs, who bring a particular expertise to this area. I mean, in thinking about the, in coming on the panel this morning, I was a, a, a little disappointed that we didn't actually have a, a PBO representative here, but hopefully during the question and answer period we'll, we'll be able to hear directly from the PBOs who are representing the audience in terms of your experience in this area and how things are going. The program itself, as I mentioned, is new for Food for Peace for this year. We, it got started in April, um, so just a few months ago. Uh, when you consider that fact, it is quite amazing to me as the, as the team leader that the response but the response that we have received it has been tremendous. We have received, quite frankly, uh, nearly 50 um, concept papers um, proposing interventions um, around the world, um, about half and half coming um, uh, in terms of the applicants coming from PBOs and the, and the other half coming from our friends at the World Food Program. The applications that we're reviewing at, as of this point, we're about anywhere from 20 to 25 of those in which we've actually taken from those concept papers and invited applicants to submit a more detailed application. We review both concept papers and applications themselves against four very specific criteria. The first being that it, it meets the definition of an emergency as identified in the uh, annual program statement or APS that was released in April of this year. That being a, a very specific shock that leads to uh, and in, uh, that creates food insecurity and that specific shock can either be a natural disaster like uh, drought or, or it could be a more complex emergency that, that relates to that, that leads to displacement of populations for example. Can I ask a question there, though, John? Sure. Because you've talked about emergency and you talked about sort of asking for these proposals in April. It's already the end of July, so three months later. Um, how can that be an emergency? Well, the, what, the program itself, quite frankly, complements the emergency response that we have provided specific to Title II. Our effort to both evaluate those proposals and to, to offer uh, an award assessment very quickly. I think we've been very successful in doing that. Our very first award was made to Mercy Corps Niger, and we were able to make that award in 37 days. I mean, that is tremendous for the U.S. government. It's certainly <laughs> yeah, and it's, and I, yeah, indeed, and, it's, and even more so when you consider the fact that it's USAID. I mean, this is something, quite frankly, that we can build on. Um, so, yeah, I think we, we've been turning these things around very quickly. I mean, one of the, to, just to kind of continue with the sort of things that we look at in evaluating concept papers and applications, another very key factor is making certain that there's adequate justification for using the funds under this LRP instead of using the traditional Title II, which we seek to complement and not to supplant. And so when you, when you kind of look at making that determination specific to, to whether or not to use Title II as opposed to, to LRP, timeliness is certainly significant. Those of you who benefited from receiving um, Title II assistance in the past, you understand that our in-kind contributions 
It can take as long as six months, quite frankly, to arrive from the moment a decision has been made until it actually, we're actually able to get those in-kind commodities out to beneficiaries on the long end and on the short end, anywhere from maybe three to four months if, if it's a bulk bulk procurement, so on timeliness it works. And also making a decision about using LRP funds based on the appropriateness of the, of, of the response itself. I mean, sometimes it's not appropriate to make an in-kind contribution because the markets are functioning adequately enough and we, in those instances, would provide or seek to support um, interventions that use cash and, and food vouchers because we recognize that you know, it's not a question about the availability of food. It's a question more of the, of the of access Great. to that food itself. Great. That's a good introduction, I think. And let's turn to Jamie because of, she's in charge of the, the pilot program, and yet you've just described a program that's already underway. So, Jamie, help us to kind of square this circle and understand how the pilot and USAID actions can go on simultaneously. Well, that is one of the challenges that we face in a lot of ways. We have a, a much smaller budget than USA does this year. We have $25 million, and we'll have an additional $25 million next year for programs as well. We actually spent our first $5 million, $4.5 million of that for WFP programs last year for purchase for progress activities in Mali, Malawi, and Tanzania. We have received several proposals this year, but we have a qualification process right now that we require PVOs to undergo before we actually review and accept the proposals for funding. And one of the reasons for that is just to just ensure that they have the capacity to do the market impact assessment, that they understand historical trade flows, that they understand the, the volume of food that's available in the market at the time, who has the capacity to purchase food, who doesn't, etc. And we also want to make sure that they have the capacity as well to actually monitor the purchases as they're taking place and then monitor the price impacts of those purchases during distribution and after distribution as well to make sure that there are no negative market impacts. And so once we get through that qualification phase, we then start taking proposals from the PBOs. This year, right now, we have decided to fund six so far. It's about $12.5 million. We've also got several on the table that are under review that we plan to um, fund with the additional resources that we have this year. I would say currently the funding for those is evenly split between emergency and non-emergency proposals. The largest one that we have received, that we have decided to fund, is just about $4.7 million, and that's going to be in Niger, and the smallest is actually $100,000, and that's going to be in Mali. And so we, we've received a lot of interest in particular being USDA in development programs. Our priority under this pilot program and our mandate is to make sure that we're funding emergency programs so that we can examine the timeliness and the efficiency of local and regional procurement, especially versus in-kind food aid. But again, I think there are three reasons why we're receiving a lot of interest for development programs in particular. Part of it is, again, USDA traditionally does development programs. And I think another reason is that USAID has a very significant budget for emergency programs. And so some of the proposals for emergency programs that, that may have come to USDA are actually going to USAID right now. We also have the issue of the fact that um, the pilot program is of such a short duration and all activities have to be completed by September 30th of 2011 that I think that a lot of PBOs are actually prioritizing their development proposals and trying to get them to us earlier so that they will have a longer period to actually implement the activities. Great. Thanks a lot for that sort of quick, quick <laughs> overview there. One of the questions, of course, is are USAID and USDA kind of jointly participating in this PVO, what you call the PVO qualification process? So if a PVO is qualified to work in the pilot program, are they also qualified in any sense with USAID? I mean, one of the more significant, I think, criteria in USAID's emergency food security program is the, uh, the, the making certain that in any sort of concept prep application we receive that the applicant is actually um, putting a proposal on the table that's justified within USG food aid response to date. It okay. gives us a fantastic opportunity not just to coordinate with uh, our uh, Title II country back south officers towards making certain it is complementary, not supplementary, but also or not, not supplanting, but also to reach out to, to Jamie and her team at, at USDA. I mean, part of our review of concept papers really does kind of look at the dollars and cents, the targeted beneficiaries, the, the, the targeted geographic area, towards making certain that we're not um, um, overspending when we, don't, when we don't need to. Okay. 
great. Let's turn then to the questions about whether what the advantages are. The ambassador mentioned in her speech that in fact she thought that local and regional purchase could help to foster regional integration of markets. And I know that's been one, one advantage that many people have cited. I think our panelists have talked about speed and cost as kind of a driving force for doing local and regional procurement. Let me turn to Phil Thomas, though, who was part of that team that did the GIO evaluation in 2009, and ask you what your view on this. What are the big advantages? Is it just speed? Is it just cost? Well, I think before we uh, talk about the advantages, I think we need to go back to the GAO 2008 report uh, for the Senate Ag Committee and the Farm Bill preparation in which the Senate Ag Committee asked GAO to look at the efficiency and effectiveness of U.S. in-kind food aid programs. And in our April 2008 report, uh, we uh, concluded and we provided information showing that it took the U.S. four to six months to get the commodities to the uh, beneficiaries, that uh, timeliness uh, was a, a big challenge, that the cost was like uh, 60 to 65 cents on the dollar went for transportation and administration. And uh, that was significant. Then in the wake of that report, uh, we were asked by uh, Congressman uh, Payne, who chairs the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, to look at local and regional purchases. And we looked at that and we did an analysis of uh, cost and timeliness with the help of WFP and USAID. They both contributed data. And for the period 2001 to 2008, uh, what we found was that uh, LRP uh, was, you know, 25 percent uh, less costly than in-kind food aid overall, globally. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it was 34 percent more, less costly, and in Asia, 29 percent. Latin America kind of broke even because of the transportation issue associated with that. When you look at the issue of delivery times, we looked at 2004 to 2008 WFP data, and what we found was that uh, time saved between international in-kind food aid and uh, regional and local was very significant. For international, uh, time save was 56 days for LRP. For regional, 106 days. For local, 112 days. So these were kind of significant uh, observations. Uh, very revealing and, and very important. And you know, we try to look at issues uh, associated with uh, economic development, agricultural development. Uh, we looked at P for P, but P for P was just beginning. And uh, what we found was that it was too early to evaluate that. But clearly, there is some potential for agricultural development as a result of LRP. You know, our point uh, in this study was that. LRP can provide some flexibility. It is not a replacement for in-kind food aid. It is one of many tools you use to deal with uh, emergency and non-emergency situations. And all we did was we gathered the data from USAID and WFP, analyzed it, uh, and we really appreciated their cooperation on this issue. And what we found was that generally there were time and cost savings that were very significant. Great. So the sort of key advantages of time and cost actually you feel are well, well documented and pretty reliable in terms of, of projecting what the sort of l larger impacts will be. And Alan, from WFP's perspective, in your assessments, are you finding that this is pretty much consistently confirmed? But in Purchase for Progress, your goal is actually not just to do cost and not just to be more speedy, but also to promote market development by engaging smallholder producers in sales to the, to the WFP program. How, what's your assessment of how those, those outcomes are being realized? 
Yeah, I think the with regard to the overall program, uh, I think Phil summed it up pretty well. That's that's been largely based on our data, and we found that the local regional purchase really does meet the cost and efficiency gain and timeliness gains that we want. I, I think you're absolutely right. P for P and, and the whole issue of how we can link the production to broader smallholder farmer agricultural development and marketing and opportunities is still at a much earlier stage. The I think the theoretical and, and links uh, based on research that suggests it can have these advantages are pretty clear, but we're still in the process of really trying this out. We have anecdotal evidence that is pretty positive. Um, we've reached a lot of farmer organizations. In places like Mozambique and Kenya, where we've done some significant purchases, they're, early, they're more developed than some of the other P4P countries. We have reports of anywhere from 50 percent to doubling of farmer income, sometimes even higher, uh, in certain, certain circumstances. We've had a number of circumstances where we've been able to draw, bring in women more effectively than was previously the case. So the, and we've been able to try innovative tools that have helped farmers look differently about how they engage and more effectively at the marketing. For example, in Uganda, we've done a warehouse receipt system where people can deposit their food that they grow, they can get the receipt, they can use a receipt for credit and borrowing to, to generate inputs for the next the next, harv the next planting season, which of course is a significant factor in able to continue to develop the gain. So I think we found that it, uh, the preliminary evidence is positive, but it is, it is I think actually uh, clear that it's going to take a lot of work, and, and I think we'll get to this in some of the other questions, to more effectively measure the development impact. It's a more complex equation than the, than the somewhat simpler task of cost and efficiency, which I think is an easier data issue to answer. Great. Let me just, a quick question for John then. Um, obviously, you already talked about sort of cost, speed, responding to emergencies, but how do you look at LRP, for example, compared to better use of prepositioning, which is another way of getting speed, at least, in terms of emergency? No, it's also it's a very good question. Prepositioning is a, is a key tool in, in terms of our use of Title II resources, making certain that um, we take advantage of having currently one domestic prepositioned warehouse in the U.S. that pretty much services West Africa and, and Latin America, and then a second prepositioning warehouse is in the Horn of Africa and the Nation of Djibouti that serves the rest of the world. In evaluating concept papers that we receive from applicants, we're not just looking at the, the four to six month timeline associated with the traditional procurement and delivery time of Title II. We also have to factor in the fact that we do have commodities in our preposition warehouse and, and depending on you know the country in which we are seeking to 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 have an impact if indeed we determine that we can get the commodities title two commodities that are already prepositioned into a, a particular arena to have an impact on food and security then we certainly take that route as opposed to using LRP funds I mean we are very clear and want to be very clear here this morning that there is nothing that we seek to do under LRP that would do anything but complement ongoing efforts with Title II. And so prepositioning commodities around the world is a component of that. In so much as we, there are plans on the way to kind of expand our prepositioning warehouses, then it becomes even more important for us to be mindful of, of that as a tool. The overall objective is saving lives. And when we can do that more efficiently with Title II, we do it. If we can do it more efficiently with LRP, we do it in line with the criteria. Okay, good. That's that's addressing the speed issue, especially very in a very straightforward way. But let's go back to GAO and, and Phil Thomas here, because one of the issues, for example, with prepositioning is that it too is not costless. So you have a cost trade-off as well between local procurement from the current market and taking from commodities that have been shipped and stored and managed and and handled. But what other kinds of challenges do you do you see, Phil? for local and regional purchase? You know, uh, we, uh, while we generally concluded uh, that there were favorable timing and uh, cost benefits associated with LRP, we had a lot of concerns about challenges. Uh, there are a number of them. Lack of reliable suppliers is one. Restrictions on donor funding. Poor infrastructure and logistical capacity. Weak legal systems. Quality standards that are difficult for suppliers to meet. 
unreliable market intelligence. And I must say, unreliable market intelligence affects both in-kind and LRP. Uh, quality problems uh, that affect both in-kind and LRP, but still, they're there. Matter of fact, we made recommendations along these lines to get better market intelligence data for both in-kind and LRP. We made a recommendation to improve uh, assessments on quality and on the markets. But, you know, w when you look back at this issue of LRP vis-a-vis -vis in kind food aid, uh, it's important to note that with the ascent of LRP, there has been favorable pressure on in-kind food aid in the U.S. to become more efficient and effective. And we see that with prepositioning. We see that in reforms on reporting, on uh, procurement, on shipping. Uh, it essentially has provided an option, and in doing so, it has created more momentum for making in-kind food aid more efficient. Great. And Alan, in WFP's experience, have you found that sort of as the challenges come up, WFP has been able to respond in ways that makes the overall program, including the in-kind contributions that WFP gets, more efficient, more effective? Yes, I would say so. And I think Phil's point that he just made, I really want to underscore. I think the synergies that come from being able to sit, whether it's with the U.S. government or other donors, and talk about the mix of the tools, you know, when LRP, when prepositioning, when longer-term commodities. Uh, we've seen it in, in a place like Niger right now, where we, sh uh, we could start with in kind before the need when we knew there might be a problem but the needs assessment was not as sharp you could get some things in the pipeline and as the needs assessment became sharper but the timeline became short because of the hungry season the availability of then moving to, lo to local regional purchase and cash options gave us a flexibility that simply wouldn't have been there in the past mm -hmm. so I think that's been a big factor the the challenges are very similar to the ones that, that Phil has identified by definition, you're dealing with smallholder farmers and you're trying to deal with the most vulnerable people. That's where market and market information systems don't work very well. The pricing issue, trying to figure out what's the price you should buy from in situations when um, it's a challenge because we have a higher standard of quality and there's, there's lots of issues in, in the pricing issue at the local level. I think the quality issue is, is one. But I guess I'd stress that there are quality issues with long-term shipment of in-kind food aid around the ocean. They're just different kinds of quality issues. One's the ones of being in ships for a long time and the kinds of infestation problems that can produce. The other is the kind of wetness and aflatoxin that comes from trying to, to buy food, often improperly dried, particularly grains, which is a big purchase for us. But the other side that I think we found, particularly with the P for P side, is that the the input and support side to the farmers doesn't always keep up to what we can do on the marketing side. Credit, uh, even when we're doing things like forward purchase contracts and warehouse receipt systems, it's still a challenge to get the credit systems in place and the input systems in place that allow farmers to consistently take advantage of the opportunities even when the marketing opportunities are there. So the supply, particularly the credit side, even more so than the than the physical inputs has been one that P4P in particular has revealed as a challenging issue to really get not the cost and timeliness benefits but the smallholder development benefits that we're, we're trying to get out of P4P. Phil, you had a comment here? Yeah, uh, from a U.S. perspective, uh, I think uh, some constraints that have to be dealt with and have not yet been dealt with have been cargo preference requirements. And, uh, you know, there is an MOU that goes back to 1987 that we've recommended be updated because, you know, U.S. law says uh, that overall 75 percent have to be U, uh, have to be on U.S. bottoms, and that could be perceived as a constraint. You know, and when we're talking about local and regional purchase, it's conceivable you would buy in South Africa and ship to Kenya or Uganda. Uh, you know, so this needs to be dealt with, and there is a significant difference in interpretation over you know the application of cargo preference rules as it relates to DOT, USAID, and the Department of Agriculture. And so there is an effort underway right now to reconcile that, but it has been slow and tedious. So Jamie, let's turn to you. 
What kind of challenges are you looking at in the pilot? Are you considering this whole range that both Phil and Alan have thrown on the table as challenges for both doing a good job with local and regional purchase, but also looking at local and regional purchase as one tool among a, a set of options? Well, I've got several points here, actually. One of the first challenges, as I mentioned, was that um, you know, fulfilling our mandate under the pilot program has been difficult because we are getting so many development proposals. And we have actually tried to accommodate the funding requests that we're getting for those development pro programs, recognizing that under this pilot program, there's a short window of time for implementation, but also recognizing that um, we still have time to fund the emergency programs, and we will be prioritizing the emergency programs from now on. Now, one of the most significant challenges that we're seeing with the development programs is the sustainability aspect of it. Again, this being a very short pilot program with really only no, less than a year and a half left for implementation, what we have been doing is encouraging PBOs that are interested in development to actually come in with activities that are not brand new standalone activities for which they have no future funding sources, but that are add-on components for existing Title II or USDA in-kind food assistance programs or some other sort of development program where they can add value to that program without making any sort of commitment or creating false hopes and expectations among the beneficiaries, among the commodity suppliers, among the host country, people within the host country, that, that there could be additional funding when under this pilot program there, there won't be. So that's one of the main issues that we're looking at again is, is sustainability. There has to be an exit strategy or some sort of a transition strategy for our, our development programs that we are funding. On the positive side, we are seeing a, a tremendous amount of interest in development programs in particular, again, small-scale targeted development programs, either for agricultural initiatives or for um, nutritional interventions that complement a lot of the in-kind feeding programs, particularly McGovern Dole and Food for Progress. And I should say, I should really emphasize actually McGovern Dole because there have been a lot of um, proposals that we have received where PBOs are interested in actually improving the nutritional content of the school meals or improving the dietary diversity by bringing in another product through local purchase, very targeted local purchases typically at the village level. And so we've been excited to, to see that. We actually have a success story from P4P Mali that I'd like to quickly share. This was um, funding that we provided last year to WFP. It was just a little over a million dollars, barely over a million dollars. But uh, a lot of the funding was used to procure commodities from smallholder farmers, particularly in the, the Mopti region of the country. And there was a small group of women smallholder farmers in the Mopti region that had been receiving support through the McGovern Dole program. There was actually a school feeding program that was underway, but they had also been receiving support through monetization proceeds under McGovern Dole to form a savings and loan group. And WP actually targeted them for a very small local purchase in support of some of their activities under p for p and so we actually had two programs that we were funding with USDA resources, one with LRP, which was P4P, and then one with McGovern Joel. And these P4P resources that we had provided went to this women's farmer group. And they were actually able to come to the table and provide 28 metric tons of commodities to WFP for the P4P program. We, we were very impressed with that, actually. They, there was no default. And they're actually using the proceeds now for income generating activities, livelihoods activities. They've purchased some chickens and some small goats. So again, a big success. Now on the, on the flip side of that though, they probably cannot ramp up production anymore at this stage. They, they're, they are marginally food insecure. If there's a drought, if there is some sort of a shock that they experience, they'll be tipped over into the point that they will actually need food assistance. Right. So. But I think you've kind of led us into the last area, and I'm just going to be very quick with the panel on this, which is monitoring. Both John and, and, and Jamie have emphasized the complementarity of LRP, and you just emphasized even the complementarity with other kinds of food aid programs between in-kind and, and locally purchased food, the, the diversity of diet, the support for local farmers, all those kinds of things. But to me, this is, you're kind of spelling out what I would call a monitoring nightmare. How are you kind of separating out and assessing the impacts of specific tools that are being used in specific areas? And how does this, how are you monitoring markets in a way that takes into account the fact that, that WFP is making purchases, some of your PVOs are making purchases, there's a regular market operating as well. How are you, how are you tackling this, this nightmare monitor, monitoring scenario? John, you want to start off and just let's just have a quick yeah. two, three comments, that's it. And then we want to make sure we get some questions from the audience. We've got 
another 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Understood. Um, yeah, it is a tremendous challenge. Uh, um, <laughs> it certainly helps that Jamie and I are actually former colleagues from USAID's Office of Food for Peace, and so there's an open and uh, rather transparent communication that we continue to share even now with her current mm -hmm. position at USDA. I mean, we have a relatively small team um, within Food for Peace that's managing this program. Um, but that, surely but you can't do it from Washington. In, it has to be indeed, your field guys. It's, it's coming. It's in there like ragu sauce. <laughs> um, we certainly have the benefit of having the team here in Washington that will be in the field in very short order, uh, following up on our very first awards. We have Food for Peace officers in the field, in the missions, or in our regional offices that are able to, to monitor and evaluate what's going on. Our famine and early warning system, FuseNet, also offers us a great opportunity to stay on top of what's happening in the market. So, Great. No, that's good. Alan, how about you from WFP side? Well, Any special efforts being made to there, sort these impacts out? There are two main ones. One on the general local regional procurement is, is definitely the price monitoring. And there we work very closely with FuseNet. I mean, it is, there is the attribution problem, but fundamentally when we're looking at market impact and we're trying to make sure that we're not producing an unfair variation in the price. So price monitoring in the collaboration between RVAM and, and analysis unit and FuseNet and others, we're doing a lot of price monitoring. Uh, in, in markets and adjusting our purchases if, the, if it would appear that it's affecting the price. I mean, we've been doing weeklies in Haiti, for example. On P for P, which has the much, much larger challenge, as you said, the monitoring nightmare, uh, fortunately, when you're funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, they believe strongly in the monitoring and evaluation component and write it into the project. So we're doing baseline studies that involve surveys of farmer groups with multiple indicators of current income um, and, and productivity and a variety of factors, and then we'll be doing follow-up studies. And we actually are one of the biggest challenges is finding the control groups because we're basically interviewing farmers that benefit from P4P and farmers in similar circumstances that don't benefit from P4P with the goal of seeing what differences P4P makes in terms of incomes and outcomes for the uh, for the farmer groups. Great, great. In the interest of time, Jamie, I'm just I had I had a, a question for you, but I'm going to because John emphasized how closely you're working together. I'm going to close with Phil here. Are you satisfied that the donors? collectively and individually are actually paying sufficient attention to m and &E right now so that when you come along in two years with a request to look, have another look at LRP, you're going to have a really good database available to you? I think that's an excellent question. I think <laughs> consistently GAO has found major deficiencies in monitoring and evaluation, whether it's in-kind food aid or LRP. And we've called for, you know, a strategic approach to monitoring and evaluation. We think the Gates model, where you spend 15 cents out of every dollar spent on a project on monitoring and evaluation, is good from the standpoint that if you look at monitoring and evaluation as a management tool, as an investment in running the program, it's cost effective. Unfortunately, historically, the U.S. government has minimized monitoring and evaluation. And to the extent that we have any influence on this, we've made recommendations to upgrade monitoring and evaluation for USDA, for USAID, for WFP. Uh, you know, as Emmy said, uh, you know, we have made these recommendations. Our rule is to follow up on the recommendations. And there is interest in the Hill, significant interest, growing interest in accountability. So uh, I suspect that, as you suggested, that within the next year or two, you're going to see a number of requests coming to GAO, asking GAO to evaluate the efficiency and the effectiveness of the improvements made. And monitoring and evaluation is critical. Great. Let's open it up to those of you in the audience here who have questions and want to get your own issues out. David. Sorry. 
produced by small-scale farmers. Um, I mean, whether you're monitoring um, whether, like when you talk about 30,000 tons uh, produced by small-scale farmers, you know, what percentage is actually, um, uh, you know, spoiled or, you know, and, and whether, whether you're doing anything to ensure that the quality is actually improved. Okay, that's a question for Alan. Yeah, on the transport side, it, it is a challenge. Uh, P for P countries tend to be, for the most part, uh, in slightly more stable countries, which do not have quite as serious a problem on the monopoly, on the transport monopoly side, where our tra internal transport costs are a little bit lower. But it is a challenge that has to be has to be looked at. On the quality side, one of the interesting things that we've been developing in Guatemala actually has helped pilot this is the idea of a, of a kind of simple kit, uh, a, a, blue, a blue book that, of sort of key points on the quality side which you can take out to the field and check the, the storage facilities and, and, and so forth to see how they're doing and recommend simple steps to improve. Our, our main quality issue has basically been drying. You know, basically, this is what the middlemen they'll they'll take the food right off their hand it, it, as is, which is usually too wet and and not dry enough for commercial consumption. So we've invested a fair amount of resources in 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 warehousing and in working with the supply side partners to address the quality issue on 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 the drying side. And I think we're making some some significant progress in that. Great. Can I just speak quickly on the transport costs? We haven't seen <clears throat> any sort of national trucking companies monopolizing any of the, the transport at this time. What we're seeing a lot of are very small scale targeted agricultural development programs for the, the development programs that we're funding. And a lot of them are taking a very decentralized approach to procurement. And so they're procuring at the, the village level near to the areas of distribution. And so that cuts transport costs significantly if it's a surplus producing area. For um, non-surplus producing areas, what we're seeing, at least through local procurement as well, is that a lot of the, the transport costs are being built into the prices of the commodities. So the commodity suppliers are actually delivering to, to central warehouses or even all the way up to the distribution points in a lot of these countries. And so again, the costs are being built in. And you don't necessarily have one trucking company monopolizing the commodity and the, the distribution. But we also have, are seeing that um, some PBOs don't have extensive warehousing mechanisms. And so, again, building the transport cost into the commodity prices, they're actually staggering deliveries of the shipments. And so that, that keeps costs down as well. Great. Some, some, good, some good experience there in terms of um, the way the structure of the programs are. Other questions, comments? Any PBOs in the crowd here who are actually implementing? Ah, Frank. Yes, thanks, Frank. There's one. It, Frank, introduce <laughs> yourself. In, Frank with uh, Capital Services. Well, we're, we're about to implement, is ah. what it amounts to, as far as uh, USDA and USAID uh, uh, local and regional purchase uh, programs. Well, what I wanted to ask um, is, is something about the future. Now, I know the pilot programs, uh, there has to be a report basically to Congress, I assume, in time for the next farm bill to see how uh, local and regional purchases go. In the 2008 and two, uh, 2009 uh, supplementaries, the bridge supplementary and the, uh, and the supplementary for 2008, there was money allocated for developmental, uh, in the developmental account uh, for USAID um, for local and regional purchases as well as the IDA account. Any expectation basically with the present administration or the plans for USAID seeking such developmental LRP uh, in the future. Um, thank you for the question. And interestingly enough, um, CRS was our second awardee under LRP also for this year. Um, speaking directly to, to your question, I, I don't know where we stand in terms of the development assistance component. I mean, our focus has quite frankly been up until date and certainly specific LRP on emergency assistance. Um, the administration has asked for up to $300 million looking forward to fiscal year 2011, which is pretty much consistent with what we were, the, re the request was put on the table for, for, the, for the current fiscal year. Dale, I don't know if you want to say anything about the, the development component of this at all. This would be that phone a friend moment. <laughs> <laughs> Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that um, that was used. Thirty million was used for the P4P program, um, not through the Office of Food for Peace, and then uh, twenty million 
was used for local regional procurement. But any plans basically for, uh, for, for moving forward with the developmental type of LRP in, inside of USAID is for USAID funding. Uh, USDA has encompassed in their pilot programs both emergency and development, and there have been monies in the past basically that have been allocated for LRP, including B for P, uh, under the developmental account rather than the, the international disaster assistance account, which would limit you basically to the uh, emergency. To emergencies, yeah, the course. 2011 request um, from, the current, from the administration, USAID, continues to be under the international disaster assistance account. Well, I, I think maybe uh, Susan's back there. Maybe she wants to. I, I think, as we see it, and again, that's for the U.S. government to decide whether there's no resources dedicated for development LRP. If you look at the Feed the Future Implementation Guide, certainly programs that you can demonstrate linkages to markets, P for P is cited in there. Again, I think what you're going to see is that, just as we see with our P for P uh, monitoring and criteria, is that the, the goal of those will not be timeliness and speed and efficiency of humanitarian assistance. It will be long-term sustainable impact. But uh, it will, I would think that if you can make a compelling case for a local and regional purchase program in development for smallholder farmers that is linked to the national plan, it's something that could be considered under Feed the Future. But there won't be, I think you are correct, there won't be, we're going to spend $50 million on, for local and regional procurement. It'll be one of several activities that could be considered to accomplish the broader goals of Feed the Future. The, with that My in mind, is. With, that, with that question, <laughs> or with that answer in mind, we have a question from uh, the, the floor below us, which has a remote video feed. And Shannon Wilson from FinTrack has asked the question that given that P4P experience has found access to credit, farmer credit, and contract enforcement as key challenges, how might USAID and USDA better support the environment in which LRP could take place, LRP and Purchase for Progress? You guys have any idea? that This is kind of a feed the future question, actually. Have you guys thought about that and have some plans with regard to encouraging that kind of complementarity? Perhaps you, John? This is actually another question. That's that, a deal question. <laughs> that, it is totally a deal question because I think it is it's so very broad and kind of speaks to you know, what he's been kind of managing as the head of our policy division. Okay. Could you, could you repeat Dale, the question you for him? And I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? You and Susan were talking. Question from Shannon Wilson of FinTrack, who's in the remote feed. Given that the P4P experience has found access to farmer credit, and contract enforcement to be key challenges for it, the P4P program, how might USAID and USDA better support the environment in which LRP could take place? That's a feed the future kind of question. Maybe it's a Susan Bradley question. It's kind of a leading question, actually. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Susan Bradley? <laughs> no, it's a wonderful question, and it does sort of touch on a, a sort of a nexus where we are right now with USAID's uh, P4P program, not P4P, local procurement program, and the idea of really making local procurement work for the smallholder and how to do that. Um, all I can say is <laughs> that the Feed the Future, uh, the intent of Feed the Future is to be very supportive of making local and regional procurement work better for the smallholder farmer. And I think we can do that both with our emergency procurements, but certainly, as Alan was saying, in situations in a country where that is actually contributing to the development objectives that are being supported anyway, that is development assistance. And so uh, I think we are going to be seeing changes over the next, I would say, next 12 months in terms of how we're approaching our own local and regional procurements and, and what we're looking for in terms of the impact of those. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Feed the Future is very, very supportive of the P4P program as well as development uh, programs that I believe the NGOs are very interested in implementing as well. Great. Okay. Last question up here. Yeah, Mara. Introduce yourself. Uh, 
Um, hi, I'm Mira Russell with Land Lakes, and um, we're also uh, shortly going to be implementing an LRP with uh, USDA in Bangladesh, and we're submitting another one for next year. But in any case, um, I have a question for Alan Jury because um, you know WFP has a wonderful uh, part of its website where you show where you procure your food and where it's used, and how much, and tonnage, and so forth, and cost. And I was just wondering, um, you know, because I know that you ship food from one part of the world to another. For instance, in 2008, you shipped nearly 13,000 tons of food from, sorry, rice from uh, India to Haiti. So considering that, there's tremendous shipment costs, and probably a great deal of administration. I was just wondering if you've done any review of the cost of shipping and administration, or the percentage of the cost of shipping and administration on your uh, local and regional purchases around the world, those cash procurements, and how they compare to your in-kind costs um, of shipping from the U.S. to various parts of the world. Have you done any analysis on that? Um, well, first, you, you raised an important question, which probably allows me to introduce a concept that ought to be there in terms of our cost efficiency, which is when we're making decisions uh, to use where we're procuring from, we use a very important concept called import parity. And we basically compare and say, what would the cost of buying, uh, say if you're buying locally, compare to the cost of buying it someplace else plus the shipping cost. So we're comparing apples and apples. So we may buy locally or closer to regionally at slightly higher prices, but when you take into account shipping, import parity, it'll be a lower price. So Haiti has a very, very high local price, which means import parity is pretty high in Haiti. Um, in terms of the overall, what are the costs of in-kind versus uh, non-in-kind? Uh, we we haven't done a sort of global study. It's, it's, it's so dependent. I, I mean, I can tell you that in Uganda, where we buy lots of food, the savings are huge if we can do most of the, I mean, Uganda's a landlocked country. If I had my druthers, I would never get a single piece of in-kind assistance to Uganda. Sudan, which is, you know, almost all the cost are the internal shipments in Sudan, the, the negligible difference between regional procurement and international arrivals is, is pretty insignificant. So I, I think it, you know, I'm afraid an average study would be like this, remember the great joke about a statistician, you know, a man who has one foot in a oil, in oil and another in a bucket of ice is on average at the right temperature. I, I think that's what <laughs> you'd see because of the wide variation between countries. So right. we tend to look at it by, by country and region rather than making global generalizations. Okay, with that sort of uh, comment pointing us back to being careful about the evidence and actually looking at the specific situation, I want to thank this panel for having kind of laid out where we are on LRP. I think several of us still have some more questions, so you can expect more in the next couple of months. But this was a great introduction and a great update. Thank you very much.